So Linda, I would love to talk to you about the theater project that you're working on right now, but also your story of how you got to this point in your life and what it's been like for you working in the theater, being a working creative. Um, do you know, I've gone all weird, you know, drawing a blank. Um, it's not been really comfortable, really, you know, like working in, you know, in the theater world, cause um, because I'm working class and because I'm half black and because I was born poor and that, I have a lot of kind of strange beliefs inside of me, you know, which actually, and I've been thinking about this today, they're not that strange because since I've been working on my project, I've come to realise that I haven't made them up. They're actually real, <laughs> you know, like, so, you know, like since I started, like, so the idea is to dig up a club that I went to when I was a teenager called the Reno, which was demolished in 1986. And it was kind of like, well, people used to go for stag nights and things as a dare, you know, like, and we were all gangsters and hoodlums and, you know, like, as, as the outside world would see us. But to us, we were like this little civilization, you know, with our own ways, our own, it had like a complete hierarchy inside the club where, the, at the at the far end, there was like a little stage where the legendary DJ would play. And to one side, there were three tables, which I call the three top tables, where the king and queen sat. And it could take as much as three years to get to them top tables, you know, with the politics in the room, you know, and things like that. So, and as I started to investigate, you know, like getting in touch with the museum and the... Um, university, you know, that we're going to fund doing this, digging up the um, the Reno. And I started to unearth things. When I was born in the 1950s, it was actually a terrible thing to be born my colour, because my dad's Jamaican and my mum's Irish. And like, there's this really famous, I didn't know that this existed, there's a really famous um, report made in the 1930s called the Fletcher Report where the opening lines are offspring of interracial relationships are born with physical and mental defects. So as I started to uncover things like that, I thought a lot of these limiting beliefs, you know, that we kind of paper over now, you know, like to be positive, to be, they're, they're not something that I've made up, they're real. You know, and then as I started to uncover them, I started to kind of have memories like, you know, like that, I didn't know me nana till I was three, you know, because I'm half black, Do you know, I don't know me white cousins, I didn't recognise me aunts at my mum's funeral, you know, like all these like different, and that was why we was in that club, because 80% of it was wall-to-wall -wall half cast, and we all kind of had, we all knew this about each other, but you we wouldn't have talked about that then, you know, we, we were teenagers and plus it was a different time. You didn't talk about your feelings, you know, like uh, you'd never go and say, oh, I feel strange because um, I was lucky. My dad was around all my life, but most of them, their dad was gone as well. And most of our mums were raging alcoholics and things like that, which now makes more sense as well if they were marginalised from society. So it's been a really, really interesting journey to kind of go, oh, do you know what? I always thought there was something wrong with me. Well, actually there was. Do you know, like, I thought, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the idea, I mean, hearing you say that, it's it's not necessarily that they were real, but that there was a, a basis for them. I mean, yeah. obviously there there is nothing wrong with you, the fact that you're interracial, but there was a time when that was stigmatized. It's true. I mean in all countries, and it sounds like in England, particularly in that area at that time. So um, yeah, I hear what you're saying. I, I think a lot of us who do have have issues like that, it's not that they came from nowhere, you know, or that stereotypes come from nowhere. There, there is a societal basis for it. So how has that affected you? I mean, going into the theater with those kind of feelings, going into the theater seems such a a place to put yourself out there and put yourself on the line and be visible. What what has it been like going into the theater with some of that background and those feelings? Well, it's always been a struggle. It's always been a struggle because I've always felt that everybody was better than me. 
And it's kind of like, you know, like I can say it off the top of my head and it kind of sounds unpopular now, you know, because you're not supposed to say these things. And, but it was true, like if I, if I was having a meeting with somebody, it would be, I'd be like struggling at every moment to, to say what I want to say as opposed to what they want me to hear. Do you, mm -hmm. do you, do you, do you know, because most people in the theatre are white and middle class. You know, like, and especially most people in positions of power, like the director, the producer, the artistic director, and they could be being as nice as pie to me. And I would take it that the everything I felt, everything negatively, that even them being nice to me had a had a reason. You know, it's just not just because they're a nice person; it's because I'm black. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, or because I'm underprivileged, or so it's it's played like a a huge role in everything that I've done, you know, but, but amazing that I carried on in the theatre world, yeah, until it did hit, it was get, it was kind of getting worse and worse, because at first, when I first went in, I had, like, you know, that kind of, I had that working class, like, am I allowed to swear? Yes. Yeah, I had that working class like, fuck you, do you know what I mean? And that kind of sincerity that comes with poverty. So I wasn't, in one sense, even though I was feeling it inside, I wasn't afraid because it was like, no, I'll do what I fucking like at all times. And that's kind of what made me go up the ladder so quickly because because of being in that club and that, I really was able to, and I was older as well, I was 39 before I went into the theatre, and I was really able, and I'd really learned this skill. I decided to myself that it didn't matter, no matter what happened, I had to be skillful. So I'd spent five years just learning my skill, going to different little workshops and practicing and on picking plays. And, you know, so I was comfortable in that. I knew what I knew and nobody, you know, and I knew I was talented. I was talented from little. And then I tied that together with like a fuck you attitude. Do you know, like, and I'll say, and you can all be, do your nice little political moves where you move your pe pepper pot in a certain way, you know, to mean something. And I'll just call it like it is. So at first I was kind of quite comfortable with that, but in any situation, things grow on you, don't they, like barnacles on a whale. So as, like, the theatre world was growing on me, I was kind of, like, more struggling, you know, like, to to feel normal because I didn't fit into their world but now I didn't fit into my world either and I've only just realized that as I said it mm. yeah. yeah well our experiences do do change us but it also changes the environment that you're in I mean you being there changes the fact that it's mostly white middle class people, the more people who aren't white and middle class that come into it and male, you know, especially in those directorial, those higher up positions, the more it changes the overall, the overall structure of, of, of what's going on in the environment. Without you there, it would stay more white and middle class, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Definitely. So since you started when you were 39, what, what has your overall experience been like going through this world? Going through the world world or the theatre world? Well, I was thinking particularly the theatre world, but the world world too. What's, what's brought you to where you are now? Well, as I, before I was 39, I wasn't really that political. I kind of, I'm a bit, I'm a bit of a cynical person. Do you know what I mean? So I, I'm cynical about politics as well. And, you know, like, I, and all sorts of things. But then a series of events happened that made me become really politicized. You know, that I went to New York with um, a certain theater company, with a theater company called Shared Experience. And in there I thought, cause when you're in England, it's kind of like, even though you might be black or you might be white, you might be working class or you might be, it's kind of like more integrated, you know. And when I was in New York and this theatre company, so I went to do Uncle Tom's Cabin with this like shared experience because in England as well, I don't know if this happens in America, but you can get money for nothing from the Arts Council, not for nothing, but you know, like for arts projects. Mm -hmm. And as we're talking about, there's not a lot of black or, you know, like diverse females and stuff like that. 
you can particularly get money for things to do with black people. Mm -hmm. So share that experience, they decided that they wanted to do Uncle Tom's Cabin, probably to get money, you know, like for a black experience, right? Because you can get a lot of money for it. So I had no money at the time either. So I went to New York with them to do Uncle Tom's Cabin. So to cut a long story short, I was in, a, we didn't do Uncle Tom's Cabin. And we went, we went on to do another play about these two UK silent twins who had burnt down the school in 1981. And again, it was about assimilation and stuff. So they're the two main characters. And we're in rehearsal, they're the two main characters. And then Polly's doing it again, that there's a psychiatrist and um, like a boyfriend. And she's asking the white actors what they think. And it's taking all day to unpack their text and understand what each line means. But she's telling the black actors what to think. And they're doing everything physical. You know, like, oh yeah, get over there rip each other's hair out, you know, like do whatever. So I'm sat in there for a week and it's like, am I, am I just cynical? Am I just hateful or am I seeing what I'm seeing? So when I did, after about, after a week, I thought, no, I'm going to be brave this time. I'm not going to stand in a corridor and just go on about it. And plus, because it reflects on my name, if this play looks like this, this is my name and that's all I've got. So I put, so on the Saturday, I didn't have the courage to say it to her face. Plus, there's kind of like a, a middle class way of talking and a working class way of talking is that I would just say what I'm saying now, but kind of like a high up middle class person does sidesteps. So she, she kept saying to me, so you mean, and then telling me what she wanted me to mean. Right? So I thought, I'm going to blow up soon. I have to go away from here. Do you know, because that's my, you know, like when you come from my background, it, you end things by just going, well, you fucking bastard, you did this, you know, and I thought, well, I'm not doing that. So I left. So the next day I sent her an email saying, you know, like, this is what I think is happening. And I felt perfectly within me, right, you know, to say it. So it turned into that I'd said she was a racist. She's been up all night, you know, like, and having, like, these really bad feelings. Not one moment thinking I might be right or I might have a point, which again feeds into what I'm saying about that I've got no rights. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So when I sort of get on a roll like that and I think, no, I'm right, I become quite calm so I, I'm, I'm vindictive really as well because I'm thinking, oh, she's really upset now. Ha ha, I'm glad. She's had no sleep. Leave her to it. But I'm calm. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so, so I stayed calm for two days, right? You know, like while her partner was ringing up, like, you know, like doing different, you know, like saying, basically saying, take it back, take it back. Right, and I'm going, no, you need to understand that this is really happening in the play. It's not good for the play and it needs addressing. So then it got to kind of like, oh, well, um, I'm, I'm only allowed to talk to Polly for 20 minutes. <laughs> when we go back to rehearsal next week, as Polly's got a family and lots of things to talk about, right? You know, like, I'm only allowed to talk to Polly for 20 minutes at lunchtime and I'm not allowed to talk in the rehearsal anymore. So I said, right, so I said, you do understand, right, that this play is called Speechless about two black girls who have been made speechless and you have now just made me speechless, right? Taking your voice, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So... So I left it, so a, a couple of hours later, their produ producer rang. So I thought, well, he's going to give me my train ticket money, you know, like, and tell me, you know, like, what train I'm getting, you know, to go back to go on rehearsal. And he said, um, Linda, I'm sorry to say this, but don't come to rehearsal tomorrow, right? And if you do, you will be removed by the police, right? Now... Again, there's another little moment inside of there that I'm sure if I was posh, white and middle class, the police would not have been added into the equation. 
Do you know, like, because what am I doing? I'm only trying to stand up for the play, you know. And, like, and this is a play that you wrote. You wrote. We 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 co-wrote it. Which okay. That I did all the work and she made all the final decisions. I know I sound bitter, but what happened the other day was I was on doing um because I've made loads and loads of progress with myself since then, so I feel sort of safe to talk about it. But the other day I was on doing the emails, you know, like I'm thinking me, me emails had said, Oh, your box is full, you need to start on doing it. So I thought, all oh, right. So I looked at all the emails from that time, you know, and I thought, what can I get rid of and what can't I get rid of from that? And then I began to read them back, you know, like, mm. and then it was like, oh my God, the pain I've been in from six years, it's here. Because what it then did, I might even cry, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> I can feel tears coming. Because what it then did was, I haven't wrote since then. Yeah. Yeah. So it really, it really did take your voice. So, yeah. And yeah. as you just said, that is the first moment that, that it really did take my voice. It really did take my voice. Because what I should have done, I should have got on the train, I should have gone into rehearsal and I should have let the police take me. Because if I really want to make my point, that is the point that I should have made but I didn't have the courage, do you know what I mean? So it did take my voice, but it did something else as well. It drove me inside. Mm. Yeah. I guess if you had gone in and let the police take you, that would have been your Rosa Parks moment. Your... Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. No, exactly. And it would have made a stink, do you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I didn't. I just cowered and I cried. So it, anyway, I decided from that, I thought, no, this is real. This is really, really, really happening. So um, I started to, this is when I started to, I didn't know before this moment that there was such a thing as authentic slave narratives. So I, start, I found that there was, and I started really reading them. And then I had another defining moment. Am I driving you mad yet, Can we not? No, no, <laughs> keep going. No, this is great. It's great yeah. to hear all of this so i had another defining moment so a thousand pages into reading me slave narratives where i'm like oh my god you know like you know like you do this slave called and i'm sure i'm getting the name right but wrong when i say this right i remember him as being called jacob d green he says i'm sorry but i robbed a horse to escape I mean, my bells went off in my head again. It's like, are you kidding me, right? If you was a white guy in Japan, right, you know, like in the Second World War, whatever you did to escape that moment is fine. In fact, you're a hero, you know. So when I really started to examine that, that it was that more than likely you can't read and write, more than likely he's telling his story to a missionary, and he has to therefore be perceived as Christian, you know, like, and from that point, I thought there is no such thing as an authentic slave narrative because every slave narrative I've read has been told with this tone, you know, like that I'm a good person, you know, like, and, you know, like, again, like I said, no mention of their brothers and sisters in the past, you know, no mention of anything good, no mention of a laugh around, there must have been times when they laughed. There must have been people that they did. You know what I mean? And things like that. So that was kind of like, yeah. And another, you, you know, like defining moment of like, of, make, of making me kind of, the only word I can use is violent. When I, when I kind of get those things, I feel violent inside. Like I need to say something, I need to do something, but I don't know how to do it. Yeah. So, oh, so when, so immediately after that, I seen two Jacob D. Greens. I seen the guy that was on his knees, you know, like with the, like his Bible sort of self. And then I seen a Jacob D. Green that would have come into the Reno. 
you know, like with his cap pushed back, right? And he would have been telling his story for like, you know, like all kind of slouched and, you know, like with his brandy going, yeah, man, and I got on this horse and, you know, like I was going like the fucking wind and, yeah, they couldn't catch me, you know, and all that. And immediately after I seen that, Jen, I seen me and I seen that I do the same thing. You know, that I'm on my knees to the arts and I didn't think I was. Do you know what I mean? But I was, you know, telling my story in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't help finding it really interesting that the woman's name was Polly that you were talking to. You know, I immediately thought of a Pollyanna. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> trying, obviously trying to, I, I'm sure she had very good intentions with trying to tell these stories and, and get the money for, for this to happen, but not actually understanding or unpacking her own white privilege at all, which yeah. is a hard thing. I mean, a lot of people who are raised, you know, we're all raised in our own little area of society and it's only through exploration and sincere inquiry and finding out what life is like for other people that you really learn what is going on in the rest of of the pockets of society, but I do think it is hard for for white middle class people who want to do good, who want to be do gooders, um, to not understand when they're actually perpetuating some of these problems. You know, like as as you were talking through that story, I was thinking of both sides and of her getting offended by being perceiving herself as being called a racist when she feels like she's trying to do good for it. But what she was doing, I mean, as you were talking about it, really was not helping the cause, was making, you know, perpetuating this thing of, of exactly what you were saying, of not fully exploring the people who she was apparently trying to help as, as full and complete human beings, of giving them certain things to do and say and not unpacking the full characters like she was doing with the white characters. So, yeah, that's that's something that I think goes on in a lot of areas of, of both the arts and life. Well, I was thinking with the, with the Reno, when you were saying digging it up, so is it actually underground? Has it been buried? Yeah, no, it was a cellar club. It was a club. Oh. It was so what I'm hoping, and what anybody I've talked to from the Reno is hoping, is that one, because the buildings above it have been demolished and they've been gone for 30 years. So what we're hoping is that they've pushed you know, when they've knocked the top buildings down, they've just pushed it into the cellar and that the cellar is there underneath, you know, mm. like, and it's just, like, been crushed by whatever they've pushed in on top of it. So, yeah. So has any ex excavation started to see what's down there? No, it's not going to... First of all, I'm going to collect... Uh, this yeah first of all I'm going to collect the archive for 16 weeks starting on the 19th of September from Monday to Monday Tuesday Wednesday I'm going to blog I've right I need to start somewhere else on this I've um to counteract what I was just talking about right and the re reason that I've never gone near the Reno to tell the story as well to counteract it is I want the people to tell their story in their own words mm -hmm. right so the easiest way that I thought to do that is that I have a website and on that website, um, I've already worked out that there's, um, that there's a time frame that there's its rise in 1971 and I've called that the rise of the flat jackets where all the lads used to wear flat jackets and love Bruce Lee and, you know, like talk about Buddha and, you know, like things like that. Then there's 1976 when I go down and I've called that women's lib where, you know, like there's more girls and things. And then there's 1979 when the flat jackets start doing like, instead of just mugging and things like that and like the girls are hustling and stuff like that. Instead of doing that, the, um, the new breed of lads who were like four or five years younger, they go out and um, hold up Asda's with a shotgun and like so that that now we've you know like everything crosses boundaries don't it you know mm. borders so now and then they don't wear flat jackets anymore they buy safari jackets you know like mm. and they've got a whole different still so 1979 is the rise of the safari jacket and then 1981 
is our fall and that's perpetuated by two affairs one is because a girl a flat jackets girl has an affair with a safari jacket and that causes civil war and then a safari jacket has an affair with a Cheatham Hill gangs girl and that causes gang war you know we, and it's all out gang war so so besides so there's that kind of like glamorous story you know like so I'm going to tell that from Monday to Wednesday and then on Thursday I'm going to have like a relevant from that bit of the story I'm going to have like a relevant protagonist so like I was saying there was the three top tables we had a king called Frank so when I get to the three top tables I'm going to interview King Frank you know like yeah, so I'll do that. And then what I want them to do is to lash their story to my story. So if I'm telling the story of, um, oh, I can't think of, say Caroline's affair, that whoever, whoever is involved in that bit lashes you know like like we like we do on facebook you know like that they just add their bit to that story so instead of it being like nobody's getting to tell their story or we're telling a black story everybody is getting to tell their story but what i'd like is an audience to witness our story as well so it's kind of like netflix but you can join in do you know what i mean mm. like as well so one of that'll take 16 weeks and in that time we'll put in a heritage lottery fund bid um, with um, that Salford Uni and Manchester Museum have already started. And then, so we'll, we've been telling our story, everybody's excited, we know all these different details and stuff. And then we're gonna start to dig it up. But that by then, it should be, we should, every screw or every table or bit of dance floor is imbued with our story. It's like sacred. Do you know, like when, when you dig it up and then um, once that's done, then we're going to have like an open night, a theatrical open night where stuff that we've collected on the podcast and that, there'll be the hole in the ground. And then we'll have like our voices coming from relevant bits because you were your station wherever you stood in the Reno. That was your station. And then we had a really fantastic soundtrack so like that we'll have the soundtrack playing and you'll only ever hear us talk between the changes of the soundtrack like if as if you were there you know mm. we'll be sat around campfires and things and then all of it artifact and archive will then be exhibited in manchester museum like it was a civilization you know so like you're going to rome or like egypt or something like that wow I'm so curious what's left in there, what you're going to find. Exactly. But when, after everybody's like, talk, as everyone's telling the story, that should be adding up and adding up to be like, by the time the first spade goes in, it's like, oh my God, I wonder if a bit of the toilet's there because there'll be stories about the toilet. You know, and I wonder if any of the stage is still there. So. Mm. How interesting. So then the space, the hole that will be left after you do this, what's going to happen? Will there be Will it be turned into something? Well, the reason that I'm doing it is because it's been empty for 30 years and they're building on it next year. So we want them to be able to see that land again. So they'll fill it in and then they'll build on it. And then I'm going to fight for a blue plaque. You know what one of them is, do yeah. 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 Well, that'll be neat. Wow, what an interesting project. That sounds amazing. Thank you. No, it's good. So if... I'm not sure how likely this is, but if anyone listening has any connection to the Reno, how should they get in touch with you if they want to participate or be part of it? Well, not just people who've got a connection with the Reno, but people who were half cast and things. Because the, the biggest thing was that 80% of us were half cast and we're in there for a reason. We're in there because we feel unwanted. Do you know what I mean? And, and it shows that this is what happens to your life when you feel as ostracised as that. You know, like without self-help books, without the culture of self-help. So anybody that's just interested in that and anybody who just wants, because we're funny as well, we're really witty, you know, and things like that. that's one of our best things, you know, like to really be witty on each other. So 
you know, like anybody that just wants to be involved because they want to hear a good story, they want to have a laugh, they want to hear a black story that's told with a black voice that's not been trained not to be a black voice. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, like, and there's terrible stories in there as well, you know, like heroin addiction and, you know, and, and then there's me who made it out, you know, like there's all, you know, and there's all sorts of, there's loads of marriages, loads of kids, loads of grandkids, you know, so as many people as possible I would like to get involved from all different kinds of walks of life and also like you Polly as well you want to hear a real story you want to unpack a story well this is me unpacking a story of a group of people this mm-hmm. is how it's done by really listening to their story not the story that you want to hear mm-hmm. or you think is the story because you're privileged there's lots of privileges in our world as well and one of them is we talk what we mean you know that's a real privilege Mm -hmm. that is yeah so where should people go to find out more so for now the best place to go is um my agent which is at the agency www.theagency.co.uk and um, my just give my name linda brogan and my agent will get it to me okay great and we'll put some links to that in the show notes yeah, and for if there's anyone else listening who is a creative who has felt silenced or had difficulty what what advice would you have for them someone who uh, is struggling to find their voice and express themselves in this day and age i think the web is a fantastic thing all you need is to start to blog if that's your thing is a writer you know like or a pet you know instagram or whatever just to start doing it and like everybody keeps saying your tribe will come to you you know like my biggest biggest thing in the last six years was to understand my tribe is really my tribe and the thing that you do you know what i mean that i could escape as much as i like but i'll do you know what i mean i needed to go back to my tribe so Mm. yeah yeah yeah, it's not necessary to have to go and kiss us in a theatre anymore. I mean, it's not. It's not. None of those things is necessary anymore. You know, Chase Jarvis is always going on about it on Creative Live. And there's loads and loads of places to get inspiration on the web now as well. Mm-hmm. Actually, a friend of mine, which maybe I'll connect you with her after this, uh, from college, she works for Ping Chong Theatre Company in New York. And um, I've been really interested in that because there was both a a secret survivors program, which was for survivors of sexual abuse. And then there's also been another one that focuses on people with disabilities. And, um, you know, kind of with the same idea that you're having is that these stories haven't fully been told because often you have able-bodied people playing people with disabilities in movies and in theater, or you have um, people, I mean, often the the stories of sexual abuse, the real stories are are not told in the first person voice by the person who experienced it. You hear it in the news or, you know, there's a movie made about it, but, um, but the, the, the program that they did was having the actual people who had that experience portray themselves on theater, which I thought was amazing. It sounds like, very much like what you're doing yeah yeah it is actually it is and the more deep I go into it the more I realize what I'm doing I just started from a place of anger yeah like and the more each day it's making more sense to me Mm -hmm. more rational and emotional sense than just I hate every fucker you know (laughs) you know what I mean like yeah well and a lot of times anger is a it's a good igniter of action i mean when injustice happens anger is a reasonable response yeah 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 well thank you so much for sharing this with us and i am so excited to see as this plays out i definitely want to keep track of your project and find out what's in the ground in the reno (laughs) and hear the stories yeah, I can't wait myself. I'm proper excited. Jenny, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for coming. It was great to learn more about you and your work. I love it. No wonder only 2% of the people make the change because as soon as you start changing, people in your peer group and family of origin will start pushing it back at you.